So first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and notwithstanding uh, my um, the title um, uh, uh, that you're talking about citizen power in the informal city, clearly as far as Durban is concerned, it's a formal city that has informality, which is a way in which people previously disenfranchised from being able to access the city through the apartheid um, uh, government. Um, the only way they could get toehold in that city and that is still being played out is in fact to occupy the streets informally as they do now. So what I plan to do is to give a very quick presentation and I'm very conscious that I'll be going through it very quickly, um, but more to set context and then right at the end I will just pose some reflections in terms of how I believe I should be addressing the topic. So if we do look um, at uh, the city, um, um, it is a port city um, and the area that is actually classified as Warwick is that area down here in, and in red. And if we look at some of the pre-existing conditions in Warwick in terms of informal practice, this is what we had back in 96. I'll be referring to these activities from traditional medicine cooking of corn on the cob, um, cow's head meat, which is a delicacy, and then street trading generally. But if you look at the years and how that area has been transformed through various interventions, um, which have been part of both the city's intervention and also our not-for-profit, um, these are the kind of inf infrastructure changes that you will see. But if you look at some of the practices and the infrastructure in detail, the first would be the traditional medicine market, and we can stretch this back into the colonial years when it was really in the shadow of the city, both as a practice and then this came into the apartheid era, definitely um, denied in terms of its presence in the inner city. Um, and so when apartheid fell and the practice started to emerge um, more legitimately in the city, this is what was in fact being hosted on the sidewalks. And to us Westerners, that would be akin to going to our local drugstore to get our medication. Um, and so one way of, to accommodate that market on the very dense public spaces that there were, which is really only the sidewalks, was an unutilized portion of the city freeway, the creation of a linear market, the occupying of that market, and then really what it looks like uh, today with the city in the backdrop. Second example would be a delicacy, a Zulu male delicacy that's eating the meat that's on the bone, um, on the skull of um, the cow's head. Um, a practice which is deeply mm. cultural, came to the streets and was hosted in very abject conditions, as you can see in the left-hand image. A market was constructed, which allowed for the more hygienic cooking of it. We have later now redesigned that market really to turn it into much more of a, a development that's akin to a food court. Um, and with that, the need to obviously develop more efficient cooking methods. Um, and that's a rough outline of the proposal as the new food court. Corn on, corn on the cob is not a domestic process. It's 200 litre drums, 13 cobs cooked over a vicious uh, wood fire, huge um, externalities in terms of urban management. The early development was to create a space where those could be cooked, uh, later redeveloped recently, but through the poor design that the city implemented without consultation, it has been necessitated for us to intervene with alternate cooking methods. And now the method which we are proposing, which is uh, a closed uh, drum system, which actually is able to manage the smoke and the fumes. This is a different intervention altogether, a space which was a, a roadway, which is became unutilized when the freeway network um, was developed. Um, and this space, turned into um, informal sh uh, shopping precinct. The city then redeveloped that as a virtually Italian galleria with a huge urban roof. 
um, and that's kind of the images of what is presented today. Um, and then at city scale, probably about a 300 meter or so long urban intervention. But if we look generally at what the pre-existing conditions were like, informal workers coming to the streets, self-made structures, obviously occupying blighted parts of the city. So very typically what we can see certainly down in the south, um, but how poor people get toeholds um, in cities. And then the interventions, the same streetscape, how that was transformed just simply by putting in purposeful infrastructure. And I'll come back to the implications of uh, urban infrastructure just now when I summarize. And then you can look at street level activities, recycling of um, salvageable materials, cardboard in particular, um, survivalist activities, um, really at the poorest end of people surviving. Um, but with simple interventions in terms of purposeful work gear, um, design of carts, and then also the design of a facility which accommodates the sorting of that material as it was built now um, and with a right level of support infrastructure. But if we were to look at the history of the area, time doesn't prevent talking about the challenge, but the challenge was that the city wanted to demolish most of that area that I've just been showing you and build a traditional shopping mall. It generated huge levels of community resistance, um, quite literally um, running riots in the streets, uh, tear gassing, um, and ultimately protests, which prevented that happening. But that taught us a lesson and that was the lesson that if what I've shown you previously was anything about um, participation, it was really an engagement as I framed it because it was top down from the city and admittedly to implement those projects one had to engage and we did find a way in which we could do that in a meaningful way. We realized that unless the workers themselves, the users were the researchers and also the implementers of their projects um, it was not going to be sustainable going into the future and so everyone was trained both in survey techniques um, and in spatial survey techniques implementing that in terms of surveying uh, their colleagues on the street us then developing infographics which were able to clearly share with both the city and uh, their colleagues what their priority prioritized needs were um, in various forms of, of infographic. And then it didn't amount to just top structures, it was also conveyances, um, it was also about generating workplace safety, it was about responding to some of the immediate needs. Um, in this particular instance, on this market, it was burns from uh, flame outs from cooking stoves uh, and then conveyances for people who were carrying uh, materials around uh, the city, designs of second, third generation carts, and then also starting to see how one could uh, dignify appropriated conveyances, particularly supermarket carts. And then, of course, there are the hidden realities. And the hidden realities, if you're working on the streets and you're a carer, particularly a mother, um, how are your kids um, uh, cared for? And so we've uh, come up with pop-up interventions which allow for child care in the workplace. And all these can be seen on our website at your leisure. And then, of course, it's responding to vulnerabilities. And COVID was the most obvious one but raising up various responses, coming up with uh, sanitizing techniques, using uh, recycled materials, which could really be acquired um, and utilized by workers very easily and at different scales. This was one which was obviously more to street level scale. And then if we look at the transformative capacity of the city, a um, huge number of examples which have now been implemented in the city um, and they labelled in terms of making wider sidewalks. We've looked at the decommissioned road and its roof in the high street of the city. We've taken over parking bays um, to create trading nodes for informal workers, utilised undercroft spaces, the motorway and the park edge. And so to summarise and to perhaps start to generate a few talking points, 
um, three or four summary ideas as to why I think what I have shown and shared is significant. The first is that all this is about the right to the city. So if we're talking about the informal component of the city um, and with the South African bias, the right to the city is really about both the presence and the preference. The preference clearly in South Africa, but it's elsewhere during, elsewhere in the world, it's those that are denied access to the city. And clearly the, that the denial is based on all the typicals, race, ethnicity, class, and even income and spirituality. The preference, and preference is very prominent here in South Africa, was people's, was the denial of culture, the idea of um, food sovereignty, and that's why the, um, the image of the corn is actually important, and corn is quite a political issue both in the South and also in South Africa. So right to the city, that would be the first point. The second would be around the infrastructure, the equipment, um, and the urban uh, furniture. Two or three points around that. The first is that infrastructure from our point of view, um, clearly it's creating um, articles that enable people to operate and for there to be fit for purpose tools um, and infrastructure, top structure that they can use. But the most important thing to us is the subliminal message that it sends and that is that what people are doing by utilizing that equipment and the infrastructure is it signifies dignity and a rightful purpose for them being there. And I think being out of the cycling context may be not so easy to understand, but that is absolutely critical. Um, and then it's also about demonstrative urban transformation. So all the cities in the South and pretty much everywhere in the world one could start to pro probably postulate is that we have colonial and occupier histories which have set an urban form which is not necessarily the indigenous urban form. And so South Africa even stands guilty 20 years on from democracy that our cities are still in many respects in denial of the primary users of those spaces. And so colleagues of ours from elsewhere in the world have now done 20 years of research and we now know that 61% of the world's livelihoods are earned informally. So it starts to raise the question about what is our, what are our urban futures like predominantly? And of course, we would postulate that they are informal. And then within the images that I've shown, this is about uh, texture, scale, and grain. So it is the bigger so-called projects, the, the urban medicine markets, but it is down to carts, it is down to washing facilities um, in the case of the pandemic, um, but also just normal health and hygiene in terms of people handling food. Um, and the other end, um, it is also, if we're talking about participatory processes, it's about agency. And so I'm hoping tonight we're going to talk a lot about agency, where does agency sit um, in terms of both the user, but if we're talking about architects, um, where do we sit in that continuum of agency? Because in my belief, we are moving continually up and down that continuum if we are to be effective. Um, and then I guess I'd also be curious about initiating a discussion um, about architects um, as urban activists. Um, sadly, I believe that one of our predominant models for the practice of architecture is a prof profession-based one, which actually perhaps at times doesn't actually give us access to um, the poorest of the poor, and those that really do need um, intervention and the skills that we've actually been trained for. And so David, I'm going to leave it at that and start to be prompted by you and uh, the rest of this discussion. Sure. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so much stuff there um, to talk about. Um, and thank you for the talking points. I've been uh, typing them down as you've been talking here. I might have missed a few. Um, I think I want to 
I think to start off this discussion a bit on the uh, the point of architects as activists. Yes. Um, so let's start there and we'll move backwards. And it, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this because I think uh, this has been sort of a common theme at the school this year are questions of activism and, and we're working on a, on a Biennale project that's sort of exploring this as well. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on sort of, I guess I'm thinking of, like you said, conventional professional training and the skill set um, that is taught to young architects and how that plays. And if you can train someone to be an activist or if they're innately an activist who gravitate towards that kind of the profession. Um, and then, you know, just your thoughts. I mean, it's pretty clear in your work. Um, but how the architectural, you know, the architectural skill set or the design thinking um, plays out in activism, you know, beyond designing things, uh, but thinking, I guess I'm thinking of your prompt as designing change, right? Like in a sense, how, right. how architects yeah. are, are trained yeah. to think in a certain way. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I think maybe what I might be bringing to, uh, to the debate uh, discussion is probably my extended years within the profession. <laughs> so the span that I showed you now, sadly starting to run to 40 years or something. And I think that's a real indictment because I think I grew up and I'm not seeing many much of a difference uh, in terms of uh, students that we interact with on a continual basis. But the model is that you will study, um, that the bright lights await you when you finish, um, you will move into a practice that might or might not have a portfolio of work which is wide ranging, but generally they will be for more formal type building responses. Um, and the remuneration model is one of a, a client pays and the building is built. And of course, that then starts to mean that if you want to engage in anything which is not directly income earning, one has to create a different model. And sadly, those models are often funded models through a not-for-profit or something like that, or as I <laughs> probably um, impolitely refer to my early years of practice, we ran what we called a Robin Hood practice, where we would have very successful um, formal life house clients and we were able off the back of that then to also engage in issues of underdevelopment. So I think the first point is, is that you have to make a decision as to how you are going to try and model your practice. Um, but part of that also is bringing to it, I guess, some own ingrained values as to how you want to bring to the world the skill that you've been indulged with. Because let's face it, it doesn't matter where you sit in terms of where you train, it will be a rare resource and it will be a highly valued resource that's being devoted to your training. Yeah. So I come from a perspective where the giving back is, is important and significant. Um, but I also think we sit in a period and I cited the 61% of the world's livelihoods, which start to suggest we're sitting in a very different world now. And I'm not postulating that we don't have formal cities. In fact, it's just the reverse. We have incredibly complex cities where, in fact, the idea when I first trained, we had the idea of mega cities. Now that's actually passe to talk about it because we have mega cities within mega cities. Um, and within those cities, you have different forms of existence. If you go to the east, you will have formal, really close and up close to very informal environments. So these are the kind of situations that we've got to get to grips with, which is going to be my third point, is that I think we've got to move from either becoming generalists in terms of our skill set, or we've got to admit that we don't bring the single answer to the problem that we have to work cooperatively so that we can all bring together a basket of general skills which can be completely responsive. And of course, what sews that all together 
is a heightened consciousness about politics, about activism, about a whole range of things which are the glue that often hold these things together. Because we must remember, if we're going to be representing the kind of communities that I've showed, they're the ones that are at the coal face and at the rough edge of poor politics, of corruption, um, and the likes under, under provision of services. And so unless one carries a consciousness and awareness of that and, and the deprivation and exclusion, because let's face it, most of us who have been privileged with the education are not at that cutting face um, of real um, exploitation and uh, deprivation. We need to really put ourselves in a position where we can understand that. Yeah. I think I think some of those comments are so interesting and you know coming from Canada the professional model is uh, as exactly as you described it I was curious when you said about NGOs um and Please. I'm thinking about you know uh having worked a little bit in Kenya academically not professionally um and just understanding like the interventions that you've done there um professional fees would be very minimal on this stuff. So how one generates a, a practice that can pay for itself in a sense, right? That allows you to 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 do that is very tricky. I mean, I, I often think about um, Mass Design Group uh, going to Rwanda yes. as yeah. as fresh graduates out of the GSD. I don't I don't think there's many interns graduating in today's professional market that could, you know, at a, at a very basic level afford to to do that. You know, you're you're saddled with tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and everybody's anxious to get a salary and so I, i'm interested in, in what you said and and you know having you know people like you and habitat for instance they I've, I've met some really brilliant architects who have changed their career paths and end up in places like that and i'm wondering within the cities do i is this kind of what you were hinting at when you mentioned ngos like do ngos hire architects where you are or do cities hire architects to do some of this urban infrastructure work so that they're not sort of paid on a per fee client basis? Is that how they kind of play out here? Okay, so I think um, there's probably a, a wider response that's needed for that. So the, the portfolio that I showed you is work that spans from interventions by the city at the time that I was working for the city and then interventions in the last 15 years where we were on the streets with the uh, not for profit. Um, and I think both of them are quite an interesting shift in the sense that, um, first of all, the city is the owner of the public space. And so you can't necessarily, as a not for profit, go and build and erect what you wish. Right. Um, secondly, there are very few funders that would fund any local government infrastructure because the belief really is that local government should be providing that that responsibility so the gap that you have is i suppose the last 15 years of our work where you can come alongside informal workers and make them opinionated um, in terms of first of all what infrastructure they want if we're talking infrastructure um, and then to be the activists that ensure that that delivery and that faithfulness to what has been agreed in terms of the preference. The softer responses are some of those COVID responses that I mentioned, the carts, um, and those are a smaller scale. Um, and also, for instance, um, social protection, which is the occupational health and safety. Those are programs which are softer and can be funded. But you can hear straight away that the space where you can intervene is one where you've got to find wriggle room to come alongside and to influence and so i guess my last provocation was that i didn't describe myself um, as an architect <laughs> i'm sort of feeling that the best i can probably call myself is an urban uh, an urban activist in the sense that um yeah, I don't come from now a traditional kind of uh, practice um, implement kind of basis, which is really sad. And so 
I certainly, my colleagues know back here in my hometown and in the country that that's my continual challenge is that we should start to be finding a model where we can bring to bear absolutely critical um, design and kind of human place making kind of skills. I mean, South yeah. Africa stands just so guilty that we are still have got human settlements that don't have architects involved in them. These yeah. are just put out as turnkey projects. Um, and I don't want to be disparaging of engineers, but the, probably the engineer is the closest professional that comes to designing this house. So there's no sensitivity about layout and placemaking. And so why are we surprised that there are high levels of crime? Why are people moving out of those settlements and trying to squash themselves into town in sub subject kind of accommodation? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting kind of idea of almost like a grassroots infrastructure is what you've been proposing, right? It's like it's not a top down. We think of infrastructure typically as top down, uh, you know, intellectualized uh, and implemented. And you're talking about inverting that, that direction, which is, which is something that's clearly hard to do uh, here and anywhere, I would think. Um, and if you do listen, David, if you do listen, you get some surprises. So yeah. the first part of the presentation showed top structures, roofs, shelters. But when we went to the streets and surveyed the traders and they surveyed their colleagues, water, for instance, came as one of the top priorities. Right. <laughs> um, so it's clearly not one or the other, it's both, but we do need to have a way. And so I, in preparation for this, I thought a little bit about it. And where, where, does, where does the architect, let's call him, them an architect now, where do they place themselves in the continuum? And it's somewhere in the middle. But when we leave, when we leave our institutions, we are led to believe that we're going to be top of the path. And that's the best place to lead from. And I'm afraid most of the time you don't hear anything from the bottom if you rise at the top. Um, and so, okay, a whole lot of writers that have written a lot about that. So the model of so-called servant leadership, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's not just about your professional skill. You've got to start acquiring um, an attitude um, and a position about how you actually want to practice your skill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to go on a bit uh well a couple of different tangents uh i think i was going to ask you about um the interventions that you have worked on and clearly i mean i love the way you tell your narrative or your story right it shows the need um and and the kind of impetus of the of the grassroots need um and then the kind of construction of the infrastructure and then sort of the flourishing of the of the culture within that infrastructure um, I'm wondering beyond like sort of the the specific examples you showed, if they act as catalysts in a sense to um, you mentioned uh, the architectural architects agency, but the, also the agency of the people to uh, in a sense say, wow, somebody listened to what we said. This is kind of amazing. Now we're seeing this flourish, and maybe two blocks away, there's those similar group of people are talking to others and saying, wow, you should. I, so I'm wondering about the the kind of contagion, the contagion, the positive contagion of this thing spreading uh, amongst the informal uh, people that you've worked with, and if you if you think that it starts to create an attitude of we can actually do stuff and we can get stuff done. And well, I mean, absolutely, and I guess <laughs> um, I wouldn't I wouldn't hold this position, but. Um, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, the last slide was purposeful. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> the last slide was purposeful because Warwick has actually been sustained for over 28 years. So if you look at the continuum from people in absolute disparate conditions on the street to where they are now, um, that is now 28 years, generations of informal workers. 
So there are now young people on the street who I have never met. And in fact, I was challenged at a meeting about two years ago where one young leader stood up and almost quite aggressively asked who I was. <laughs> and, and it was quite surprising to me and also really refreshing because he'd obviously, it was a he, had inherited that site from his parent um, and was now a career informal worker. So if you look at the South African context where it was completely outlawed, and I mean night and day, you weren't allowed in the city, full stop, um, to now running a business on the sidewalk with a range of permissions, which give you by and large security to be there on a daily basis, to fly your trade, to earn the income. That is chalk and cheese. That's the first thing. Um, and secondly, um, the, the structures that are on the streets, which are pretty much invisible, certainly in this presentation, are now pretty sophisticated in terms of the committee structures that they are, in terms of representation. So yes, it's not an ideal world of you know, fully democratized elected leaders, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a leadership and there's organization. Now, again, in the South African context, coming from a principal decision about the apartheid or principle of the apartheid government is to disorganize people. That's how they manage to maintain the system. So to recover from that absolute deprivation to one of organizing um, and being organized is also incredibly important. Um, and I'll finish my response um, as an indication. So I won't go into all the detail, but there was a failed project where a contractor had not delivered an expected project. Um, the local government called together the contractor and the traders, and we were more observers in the process. Um, and the meeting started and there were routine questions about why he the contractor had done what he did. And suddenly, from the trader community, this is an informal worker, completely uneducated, put up his hand. And the first question he asked is, can I please see the plan that the contractor was working to? Mm. And that was a deal breaker because, in fact, it was, the problem had arisen because the city had verbally instructed that person what to do, and there wasn't a plan. Now, I was blown away. And when I realized that that level of appreciation starts to sink down into the leadership in terms of how um, um, building happens and how transformation, how are we going, place making happens, that there is a process and it's all structured. And once agreements are made, then one sticks to them and sees the results. I mean, that is pretty deep process work, um, yeah. which is embedded in that person's response. Um, and so I'm convinced uh, that there is a very deep kind of um, imbibing of what is going on, even if it's not really clear and you can't actually see it articulated. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great um, answer. Um, I wanted to pause and see if anybody online uh, would like to ask Richard a question or have a comment. I'm not seeing anything pop up just now, but everybody prepare in your minds. Um, oh, Adrian's put on his camera. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could jump in. Um, thank you very much, Richard. That was really amazing to see. Um, I guess I'm thinking about education and how, like, it seems like, so, you know, in a number of statements you've made, you've talked to kind of characterized a certain self-conception of the architect that maybe heads off the, the possibility of doing this kind of work. And I'm wondering about how you see education changing. I know that's also something, David, you're thinking a lot about how architectural studios function and how the studio environment produces a conception of the architect that doesn't allow them 
allow them easily to work or naturally to work in the ways that um, you're talking about. And I'm wondering if you if you do. I don't know if you're teaching right now or if that's something you you've done at different moments. But um, certainly, we're in a school here, and I think we're very interested in those questions. Um, yes, so I have taught part time in the past, and each year we have. Oh, I think this year we've got five or six uh, <laughs> dissertations that we, you know, they're locating themselves within Warwick and informality. Um, I can't hear. Adrian, can you hear me properly? Everybody you else can. Answer. Adrian, can you hear me all right? I'm I'm hearing you fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, Adrian, it's an interesting question because, um, my response is going to be not a defeatist one, but I'm going to say that I'm not sure that it can be easily taught, because part of part of it from my experience is that you almost need to be to start to become comfortable in the messiness of how this whole process doesn't necessarily have a, have a guiding light. You're not in a particular position at any point in time. You're sometimes leading it. You're sometimes listening. Um, you are, <laughs> I mean, a week ago, we were filling potholes on the, on the sidewalk in support of traders who <laughs> had dysfunctional sidewalks, you know. Um, and so, but all those are events that you use to be able to grow your understanding of what's happening in the street. And so I guess part of that security in terms of knowing how it all fits together, being comfortable with an evolving process is first of all, you've got to be clear about what a process is. And those are quite, I'm not being disparaging of, of early graduates, but those are things which I'm afraid only come with time, in my opinion. Yes, you can take yourself to a camp somewhere in the south and build something, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in some senses, that the real lesson from that won't come in the two-month exercise, it will come in the one-year exercise. Um, and so I think in the pressured time that um, we are all in an institution and being absolutely pummeled with how much we meant to have in our heads, and which of course is another thing I think which we're guilty of, we are trying to push so much information into people's heads and by the hour it actually increases <laughs> um, that maybe we need to be moving towards kind of and even some sort of early speciality that I can see that that would be dangerous in terms of the argument I've been putting up as well. So I think it's the answer is collectives and we need to have a range of people's experience and then people are able to sort of come in and be supported at a particular point in time with those skill sets and with um, that kind of knowledge. Now, the last part of my answer started to get quite flowery. So um, it's not an easy answer, I can assure you. And um, we know that probably the students that come and intern in our office, it probably takes them about almost eight to nine months before they start to really feel comfortable about not knowing what they're doing. <laughs> and when you get to that point, of not knowing, then you start to be comfortable to start to think where you can start to get a grip. Um, because the native skills we've got, I mean, that's been taught. It's actually the application of it and being comfortable about applying it. That was a, a great answer. Agent, I think you, you probably didn't miss as much as you thought you did, because I think you've kind of summarized it at the end as well. If I took away the emphasis there, it was that you know, at least my 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 summary, and let me know if I'm wrong, Richard, but it's this is not something you can kind of take in a studio or in a course and then expect to understand how to work in these conditions. It's uh, this slow process of really um, being gaining awareness from connecting with people and, and that informal world that um, gives you the skill set. It's it, it's not a textbook uh, application, right? Yeah, correct. <laughs> 
Yeah, I um Adrian, did you want to follow up with anything or no, that was great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Yeah, I think it actually, I mean, it's a bit of a tangent, but it reminds me a lot of some of the conversations we have about uh, Indigenous design conversations going on in Canada right now, where, you know, uh, for people that grow up um, uh, around Indigenous communities, um, uh, and somebody wants to take a course on Indigenous design and then apply that in, in a in a community, it's very difficult, right? It's uh, they're, they're all the 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 um, subtleties um, uh, of, of those those cultural exchanges and relationships that, that you just can't teach. Um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to, to maybe if you could comment on this again, and I'm referring to some of the work that, well, I'll give you a bit of background. So uh, when I taught at Montana State University for five years, we, we had a relationship with um, uh, colleagues in Nairobi uh, and in rural Kenya. And the first year we went, we were in the, the slums in Kibera. I don't know if you've been to Nairobi before. Yeah, yeah I know. And yeah, and there were so many um, international like NGOs and universities and people, you know, the kind of helicopter in people, which we were we were of that group. Uh, we were there more observing uh, than anything. Um, well, and I guess this is a response to what you just said. Um, people w went there to apply their design thinking, I felt, um, in a context that was so foreign that they were spending their whole time just trying to understand what was going on. And, and you end up almost just producing uh, innate objects that don't have meaning where they are, or they kind of miss the mark in many ways. So all a lot of goodwill, um, but really the effectiveness of it, because it's not informed by the, the situation, is it feels a bit empty. And uh, I think that's been a problem. <laughs> That idea of you know the the dead aid book uh, of people wanting to do good and sometimes doing the reverse just by their presence. So I think that's that's context. But out of that work, um, I remember reading Saskia Sassen at the time and really observing more than anything about the relationship between the urban and the rural um, conditions in these places, which is again quite different than uh, in the you know let's say North America. I wondered if you wanted to just share your thoughts on that with with the students here, the 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 informal community, because um, like you said, throughout the African continent, the it's it's the largest part of the economy, um, but it's also deeply in, in interrelated to what's happening in the rural context, from my understandings. Um, okay. So I wonder if you want to talk about that urban rural relationship and how that might impact or inform your work. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think the fact that um, city users, and I'm, so I will use that purposefully, have these very strong links back to the rural condition, starts to set up a really interesting relationship between how people use urban space and um, and so, for instance, a person who is accustomed to a formal city would see that as being their place and they would, you know, they would ascribe them a stronger sense of permanence to that space and that might then start to drive the, the urban form and what that looks like. Um, and so I think when someone has this ambivalent relationship between either in or out of the city or the strong link, that continuum, it starts to mean that you are not only kind of spreading your interest, but you are probably able, or you probably have to weigh up in your mind where you build your, po your permanence and where you are making your investment. And so we do know that a lot of people here in South Africa um, invest a lot of their capital in building a more substantial rural home in terms of traditional building materials, brick and mortar, um, steel, um, which is now a new phenomenon in terms of something that's changed. And so it's starting to indicate that you'll um, earn your livelihood in the city, but you will actually invest back home. Um, but of course, there are all sorts of social kind of uh, challenges about why that happens. So South Africa, very poor um, uh, social protection. So 
in your old age, you would probably be better supported by an investment in a rural substantial home that your family and children have contributed towards. In other words, that's the asset and that's your sort of, um, you're going home to kind of security. Um, so I think there's that component to it. But I think it's because of that um, and how some of the tension plays out in the urban space that we are not seeing more pressure to transform the urban really indigenous in terms of representing all these kind of challenges. And so you either still have in South Africa in particular, and Nairobi is also an example because of its colonial past, of a core formal part of the city which is doing its damnedest to keep itself like that. <laughs> and then a huge contrast like Kibera, where there's huge levels of spontaneity just in terms of how people are, are organizing themselves. And so there's not a meeting of the mind in terms of how that plays out both philosophically with a vision and also just in terms of urban form. So right throughout Africa, and certainly the examples I've been exposed to, you still have core parts of the city which are still seduced by the funding agents and the World Bank and all the others that are propping up this formal core. Um, and that is meant to be the political guiding light. That's still the aspiration. And everything that's happening on the side is not actually valued and seen of purpose. Um, and that would bring me to my third point, that if that kind of debate and that realistic practice is not playing itself out, you are not going to see some sort of emergence of a real response. And so we do hold out Warwick as an emerging example of how if you sustain it, you let it be, and you provide the right uh, level of participation in terms of the community um, having an active role in what is forming, you start to get a, a kind of a glimpse of what this melded city could look like and what the preferences could look like. So, um, yeah. Durban is the only city in South Africa that has this really big traditional herb and medicine market virtually on the doorstep of City Hall. Now, for as long as we continue to design with the dichotomy and not integration, we are going to still see these pinnacles of difference. And so I think the kind of the quest is to try and make sure that we can be challenging um, ultimately an inappropriate urban form um, and also a kind of an urban management process uh, urban management principles which are actually holding back um, sort of the closing of the waters as it were where we would get some level of um, emergence of okay the so-called African city is elusive. No one could really define what that is, but we certainly know what isn't African. <laughs> um, and in some instances, that's being held back by political aspiration and skewed vision and all the likes. I was just thinking about the what you're talking about and that idea of emergence, which to me seems very critical. Um, to It's kind of core to everything you've talked about tonight because the work that you presented, like I said, wasn't top down thought out, it emerged out of out of the conditions of it. And I was thinking, I, I mean, this is a much longer conversation, I think, but um, I'm thinking about housing. And so in Nairobi, UN Habitat, um, and I'm sure they've done the same thing where you are as well, where part of the solution for a while was perceived as to basically, everyone was focused on the house um, or the, the living conditions of the person where they sleep at night. Um, and trying to make that better. So they would come up with these housing blocks, right? Um, and then on the ground floor, they would, um, basically it was apartments on all four floors. So you end up on these whole swaths of the city now that are these formalized housing blocks 
uh, without realizing somehow miraculously that they, by doing that, had removed the informal economy livelihood of all those people. So all those people that were selling, you know, uh, comic books out their window or used shoes or whatever they were selling now were up in a second floor and, and it just was a disaster. So um, I, th- I think that everything you're describing there, because there, there's nothing to emerge in that environment. You, you, you've yeah. removed it. And, and we found it so interesting that so many people that were living in Kibera, for instance, when, when they talk about their homes in Kibera, they, they wouldn't describe that as that. They'd say the place where I stay, yes. you know, which means that the informal settlements for the outsider looking at it, it looks as if, oh my gosh, these are these people's homes. They're really living in these terrible conditions. But they, I don't think a lot of them perceived it like that. It was more the place where they stay as they're making their way through this economy and and this relationship between their home community and and basically like you said the uh the uh what did you say robin hood practice in a sense is finding out how to pull money out of the formal system and put it back to their family and their communities that's they're navigating that territory Um, not to not to say that the housing wasn't a terrible situation of course it was but um I, i i find that 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 is such a different way to think about the way people are inhabiting the city um, and that, that's, again, your projects that you've shown have been so wonderful to see how the infrastructure in some ways facilitates that, actually. It facilitates that navigation for those communities and, and what they need to do that in the best way to serve themselves rather than telling them what to do. Well, it is a belief that a lot of what you've described is, so if you look at Kibera from the opposite way around and not look at the at the homes or the shelter and look at the public space it's the public space that is actually the active it is the really active and important ingredient um, and that's our belief in terms of informality i mean the city is trying its best to remove informality from the streets because they're seeing it as a political poor signal that the city is not aspiring and there's this very evident level of poverty which is playing out on the street. Um, but it is providing an incredible um, kind of entry level. And I've, I have another, and I think I use the expression tonight, toehold in the city. I speak a lot about that, that that's what people are trying to do. They're coming into the city as new urban um, a, a desire for an urban life and but how do you actually start that and how do you navigate it and so an informal settlement is exactly that that's how a person starts um, and it's through getting the little kind of cellular kind of kind of exclusive space but it's how you then start to relate to your neighbors and to share the toilets and the water point and preferred pathway to somewhere and of course, they all change during over time. What it looks like in the morning and what it looks like the night, what it looks like on a weekend or a holiday, it's all completely different. So I don't want to be sort of kind of naive and using this expression, but Africa is about the public spaces. And that's what the colonials didn't understand when they designed our cities. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's what we're fighting to try and get back again. Um, but there's a bit of a kind of a comfort zone which our current politicians are kind of hanging on to because everyone else in the, the world that's lending their money is trying to tell them that that's the bit of the order that they need. Um, but, you know, I keep throwing the 61% at us. I mean, what does, and the generation that we're talking to now primarily, what is your world? Is it... An urban, is it a formal world or an informal world? You've got mm-hmm. Airbnb, you've got Uber, you've got <laughs> all sorts of systems now which don't use the same benchmarks um, and also have permission to gather themselves in an urban form in a completely different way from here on. And so yeah. why should we be pigeonholed into thinking that um, that translates into a particular urban form it might translate into the way we practice. So if you say that you're now in an informal world, what's going to happen to formal, formal practice as we described earlier in this interview? Mm. 
that could well go up to the window and you might actually be commissioned on the basis of an Uber call. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Someone tells you they want a quick house and can you deliver it? Yeah. <laughs> Send yeah. us your proposal. I think you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting prompt. And, you know, uh, maybe uh, I'm thinking that the younger generation, the folks on the on the line here may already be, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's hard to say, but maybe they're already predispositioned to be able to respond in some ways because of that world that they've grown up in, at least in certain contexts. I mean, I, I hope that's true. I hope that there's an evolution happening there. Um, because it's interesting as you're talking about public space um, and I don't know, maybe others on the line would, would disagree with me. I mean, I grew up in Northern Saskatchewan um, where I can't think of a good public space in Northern Saskatchewan, like not even one. I mean, it's uh, partly because of our climate. Uh, it's a very privatized emphasis on existence there. there there's, I, there might be now, but there certainly weren't any things like markets, even, uh, you know, the shopping malls were the public spaces, I guess, would, would have been the, the typical scenario. So yeah. um, I do think there's a different, um, different emphasis here. Um, I wanted to pause again and see if anybody else had any questions for Richard or uh, comments from any of the students online. We originally, um, oh, here comes somebody. Hi. Beth. Um, yeah. My question is more general and kind of simple, but I kind of wonder how you get started in this kind of work and how you do that initial outreach to work with communities, because that's always something that I've been kind of interested in participatory design. but kind of the the starting point is what I'm wondering about. Yeah. Um, yeah, there'd be there'd be a couple of couple of answers. I mean I think I've already alluded to the fact that one needs to be comfortable about working in that type of environment. Now that might sound uh, a bit, it might sound quite simple, but I mean, in the context that I'm coming from, uh, uh, no surprise, I'm white, majority of the people are black, I speak English, <laughs> uh, South Africa has 11 official languages and uh, you know, 10 of those aren't English. Um, and so, you, it, and it's very similar to my early experience of Canada, I mean, it's it's clearly that's starting to emerge now as a, a challenge. If you really want to get close to designing in that way, you have to be comfortable in those environments. Um, second, it would actually be the opportunity. Now, I would consider that in terms of my, uh, I was going to say history, my role. <laughs> my role is that I've had huge privilege in being able to be exposed to those situations. So certainly my time in the city, um, which was really around urban regeneration, presented those opportunities to start to, by necessity, to engage and do something. Yes, we chose to take it on a particular route, um, which was to create the infrastructure. I guess if I wasn't an architect, I might have taken a different approach. Um, the third point is that, um, I mean, if you were to look at our website, we've got one of our pillars, one of four pillars is what we call urban intelligence. And urban intelligence is really about observing. It's around being a passive observer about why people do things, because as much as we could have a good process that elicits people's responses and reasons why they would do things, more often than not, they aren't able to tell you. Um, in South Africa, very particularly because of the poor education system and also because of apartheid, um, people weren't invited to give opinion. And so there's a huge dearth in the early post-apartheid generation where Seemingly, no one would say anything to you if you actually went to consult. Um, and then the fourth point is that I think you do need to have, um, wherever, wherever you draw your inspiration from, but you do need to have an awareness or a skill in terms of how you communicate and how you elicit 
Um, for me, it was a lot of third world reading about game playing in terms of playing games to elicit design responses. Um, we've also, over time, I guess subliminally almost, you start to develop what we call reality checking. So it would be asking that same question three or four times. Um, and if you have a community meeting, for me, it's not what the community tells me, it's what the community is not telling me. So in fact, I will probably have longer meetings with some of the people that were silent at that meeting as one-on-ones to really get the full picture. So I think the summary of that is you've got to be intrigued about the process um, and, um, and starting to, I don't know, it is about vision building. I mean, I've spoken a lot and I believe a lot of, about holding a vision and making a vision clear. Um, and so again, in a community that hasn't been given permission to express itself, to occupy a particular space, um, to um, earn its livelihood in a particular way, um, the mirror that it's looking into is one that isn't their reality. And so you have to move that mirror out or turn people to face in another direction so they can see a vision which is reflective of, of their reality and what they want to achieve. So it starts to edge towards the kind of the activist view that I ended with the presentation where um, yeah, every now and again, you've got to stir it up. <laughs> and so it's a combination of bringing, uh, bringing the skills which you've been privileged to acquire, um, adding huge insight, having a real interest in process and communication um, and, demo and basically democrat democratic decision making, and then, and then vision building. Vision building is incredibly important. And that's why I think architecture is just such a powerful tool for it. We have got so much to offer in terms of our training, in terms of how, I mean, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where it hasn't necessarily been an architectural solution, but it's been a design solution that's actually been the deal breaker because someone believes that they can't do something I mean, take one of the one example which I showed about the widened, widened pavements that we've done in the city. Now, a common challenge is that we can't have informality in public space trading because, quote, the pavements are overcrowded and there's no space. Well, I mean, <laughs> please make the space, make the pavement wider. <laughs> the debate is whether the cars need the space or the people need the space. So a very simple um, design solution can actually be a deal breaker. Now, unless you are kind of, are, it's a mixture of having the um, design acumen and the vision to be able to make that state, statement, but also driven by some activism that there's got to be a solution. You can't have a stalemate. So how can we actually mediate this and architecture I can come back to time and time again, is that architecture is the deal breaker. I mean, everyone that's on this, on this um, uh, Zoom now, um, we have just got the most incredible skill that's either there or it's being built. Um, and uh, I can assure you there's heavy pressure on you to bring that to reality because that's going to be the deal breaker in terms of our futures. And your future is going to be longer than mine. <laughs> a great Thank answer. You. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Uh, there's a question here in the chat for you. I don't know if you've seen it. A question is about one of the projects about cardboard recycling yes. uh, project or zero waste project. Um, how did you approach to these projects? How did you approach these projects and how did they involve community participation? Okay. Um, yeah, very interesting and uh, insightful in the sense that you've referred it to zero waste. So <laughs> um, it's almost reverse engineer, quite frankly, um, in the sense that I guess the initial response was a livelihood response. There were individuals who were in the public space and as part of their livelihood strategy, they had chosen to collect um, 
articles of value that could be resold um, for income. Um, but of course, you saw the images and the pictures of how those individuals were forced to work, um, both because of their lack of means to get a, appropriate equipment, um, but also because of lack of rec recognition from the local authority, um, the local government. I mean, they initially, they were not in favor of that practice simply because what it looked like. Um, and so by designing appropriate carts, giving people appropriate workwear, starting to uh, structure that activity as a legitimate structure, started to secure their livelihood and started to change attitudes. And so as of last year, for instance, there is a new national document which has gone out. Um, and I know this is part of a, a worldwide kind of movement, particularly in the South, uh, Latin America, the strongest of, but certainly now in South Africa, it's going to be law that local governments have to incorporate informal workers into their waste management system. And so that moves us now to one of our core projects that we've got, which is looking academically at zero waste. Um, and that is around the particular market, the core market that was in that complex. I didn't highlight it in the presentation, um, but it is around dealing with the organics. Um, and we, as our component, are dealing with the street conditions. It's human waste. It's abuse of stormwater catch pits, um, uh, alternate methods of uh, dispensing uh, cooked food, in other words, moving away from polystyrenes and all the un, un, uh, plastics that aren't recyclable, et cetera. So it is now coming into mainstream zero waste uh, thinking. I hope that answers full enough. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else have any, any questions or comments? Uh, we've gone uh, over your time. I just wanted to confirm in case anybody was curious. We, our second speaker, uh, Juan Dile, uh, is uh, not able to make it tonight. So we've been, Richard has been very generous with his time to sit and chat with us longer than he was probably expecting. But um, I think it's been great to to dive into some of these questions with you and hearing more, more of um, context about everything you're doing. So um, if there's no other questions, I'm going to propose we we kind of wrap it up and I just wanted to thank you again, Richard, for your time and, and, and your work. I think you've shared a lot of stuff that uh, is new to me today. So uh, yeah, I think that's it for tonight. Richard, thank you so much for your time and all your work down there. That's incredible. What a, what a career and what a, what a lot of difference you've brought to people's lives. I, I really feel that in your work. So I, I'm a huge pat on the back to you and uh, thank you everybody for showing up tonight. Um, thank you, David. Um, and uh, well, it hasn't been hasn't been tough to, hasn't been tough to do. It's been an incredibly rare opportunity to be able to engage a skill that uh, yeah can make a difference. And so it's been fun. And this presentation has right. been useful as well. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care, and I get to bed. It's late then. Thanks very much. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Bye.